flip it over to the defending Super Bowl champions, the ones who beat the Kansas City Chiefs, who harassed relentlessly Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Hey, everything was looking great a few weeks back, Mike. Six and one, heading into New Orleans for a Halloween game against a team that doesn't have Drew Brees, and they lose Jameis Winston in the first half. Going to be easy. Going to finally beat the Saints in the regular season. Going to get to 7-1 and one going into our bye week. And we know how good we are coming out of the bye week because last year we ran the table coming out of the bye week. Well, they lose to the Saints. And they still get their bye week. Hey, hey, we lost going into the bye week last year. Right. No worries. We still ran the table on the other side. They ran into a buzzsaw yesterday in Washington. I still don't know what happened to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm not sure they know what happened either, Mike. But now... Six and one has become six and three. And oh boy, there's a different vibe coming from the defending champs. Well, uh, listen, there is. And, and we saw this a couple times last week, right? That we talked about uh, where, where you just expected a team to be able to walk in and get the win. And it wouldn't be a what if game at the end of the season. Well, I, I get this is, again, why we say this is professional football and you never know. You know, look at Detroit and Pittsburgh, what happened yesterday. So you just don't know. They're all professional football players, and they can step up at times and play a game. And the Washington defense yesterday was able to do that, a defense that, as we've talked about on paper, we thought was going to be one of the better ones coming in to, to, to this season. And so what? In the first two passes, or the first six passes, there's two picks now. And Bruce Arians blames them both on Brady, but I mean, one, you know, was was in the receiver's hands, and it got knocked out, and ended up being a turnover. So I, I'm not putting that one on Brady at all. I disagree with Bruce on that. But the other one was certainly on, on Tom Brady. So, you know, give again, give Washington credit, but you still scratch your head and you say, okay, you expect a couple of a, a bomb here or there you know, by one of the better teams. But we've seen two in a row with a bye week in between by Tampa Bay. So you wonder, you know, will we see that again? Is there a vulnerability? You know, and I know we'll talk about Tampa, uh, Tampa Bay in this, but I got to say this, Mike. In, in, so everybody knows a two-minute drill when you're behind you two minutes, you're trying to, trying to go ahead. Well, there's this thing called the four-minute drill. The four-minute drill is for a team that's winning. And can you control the ball and run it out and never let the offense get it again, especially a guy like Tom Brady. And the four-minute drill can be anywhere from four to six, seven minutes and say, can you really put a drive together, you know, and close this game out? Washington put a drive together of 19 plays, 80 yards. They took 10 minutes and 26 seconds off the clock. There was 29 seconds left on the clock or just a little more than that when it was fourth and one. And Riverboat Ron went for it on fourth and one, and they scored a touchdown to make it that 19 play, 80 yard, 10 minute and 26 second drive. They went up two scores instead of kicking the field goal where it still would have been a one score game and with Tom Brady with the ball with any time on the clock is dangerous. So that to me was one of the most impressive things I saw yesterday. Again, 19 plays, 80 yards, took almost 10 and a half minutes off the ball. It ended with a touchdown and a two-score lead and iced the game for the Washington football team. So that was against a really good defense. And unfortunately, at the end there, Vita Vea, they lost him. He got carted off the field for Tampa Bay. That did not look good. But that was one. And I know this is more about Tampa. I, I get it. But you got to give love where, where love is deserved. And that was one of the most impressive drives I have seen from a team that knew they needed to do that against a team that knew they needed to stop that team from doing that. That was really, really impressive. You mentioned Vita Vea, knee injury. is going to have an MRI today, and that is something that could be a major negative impact for the Buccaneers' defense. How good they got last year when he came back from an injury during the postseason, a time when nobody really expected him back. That hurts that run defense. The other thing, though, that really amazed me, I'm not a big fan. I don't know about you. I'm not a big fan of the short yardage shotgun formation running play. You get down to the goal line like that, that fourth and one play, and Ron Rivera told me after the game, Scott Turner, offensive coordinator, called that play. I like to have the quarterback have options. I like to keep that, especially if I have a quarterback who's got some mobility. I want him to have the ball in his hands because somebody gets open, 
Maybe this guy, maybe this guy, maybe this guy. Just three reads, fine. This guy's not open, this guy's not open, this guy's not open, I'll run. You've got more chances. You put all the eggs in one basket with the handoff out of shotgun formation. The running back starts flat-footed, but he squirted right through. This is the vaunted Tampa Bay run defense. He just squirted right through. That was the ultimate icing on the cake of what was, Mike, the longest drive of the year by any team, and it came at a perfect time. So, yeah, the four-minute drill became the 10-minute drill, and, and it just sucked the life out of the Buccaneers. It really did. I mean, that was one of the most impressive things I saw. And I get what you're saying. You know, have options at the goal line. I get it. But, you know, there, there, there's some time where you just want to line up, you know, and, and say, okay, we're going to get there, we're going to not. Now, again, remember, if they didn't get there, they still had the lead, and Tom Brady would have had to drive his team 99 yards in a very short time, something that still is a threat that he can do. So it wasn't like this was for the lead. So I understand it a little more, but, but I understand what you're saying about wanting options on a play there as well. So, you know, for Tampa Bay, so this is now them trying to, you know, gather themselves together, you know, kind of like Kansas City had to do, you know, a few weeks ago as well, kind of say, okay, what's our issue right now? I know Bruce Arians was obviously not happy after the game about the dumb mistakes, as, he's, as he has said. But so that will be interesting because there's a lot of veterans on this Tampa Bay team about the self-scouting and the reflectiveness that goes on. It won't be so much about who they're playing. That's not what it's going to be a lot about for Tampa Bay. It's going to be a lot about what are we doing wrong? What are our issues right now? You know, I know you'll get players back like a Gronkowski back at some point, but you shouldn't need him right now. You want him healthy for when you need him in the playoffs. But this is, this is that self-scout, look in the mirror, look at your own film time for Tampa Bay to try and figure out what's happening. And, Mike, I think what makes it so jarring for the Buccaneers and for everyone else, this is a team that was new last year with Tom Brady there and the new pieces, it took time to come together and it finally came together and they won the Super Bowl and they kept everyone in place. So this is just part two. This is just pick up where you left off. Right. And it, it started off that way. It was working through seven games and now all of a sudden they've been slapped in the face twice and they're, they're left to search for answers. And you mentioned Bruce Arians. Let's hear a little bit from him after the game as he tries to get his team refocused on winning ways. That's very disappointing. I mean, it's very alarming to, to watch the energy that we practice with and show up with the lack of execution and energy that it takes to win in this league on Sunday. Um, we got a lot of soul searching to do. Oh, that has nothing to do with ability. It's, it's all about execution and, and, uh, and, and being a smart football team. We're a very dumb football team. And that's a, that's a reflection of the coaches. A second straight week that Brady's had multiple interceptions. Can you just speak to what was going on maybe with the, the receivers? And the no, I had nothing to do with receivers. It was him. <laughs> now, look, look, I, I, I got a ton of respect for Bruce Arians, but the first interception was caught. <laughs> I don't know what Tom Brady could have done other than not throw the ball to that guy. He threw the ball to him. Yeah. He had the ball in his hands, and, and it arguably was a fumble, not an interception, because he caught it and he turned, and then he got hit. And so right. I, I don't get that. My, my, my only explanation for it, how, does it on, how is that on Brady? I think this is a retreat to last year when we would hear Arians from time to time call out Brady because if you're calling out Brady, you got license to call out everybody. And this is just Arians' way of trying to pull the ripcord on the lawnmower. And he's just going to start calling out Brady because that's his way of, of just getting things back under control. That's my only explanation for it. Yeah, listen, I, I wouldn't doubt that. And it's not the first time a coach would have done that and say, go, go to the best, you know, rip the best player or say it's the best player's fault to know that you, like you said, can say it to everybody else. I mean, if you want to go on the field, the only thing I can think of is Arians was thinking he should have thrown it to a different person. But still, it was second and ten. You throw it to that receiver, it's going to be third and five. It's a manageable, you know, down in distance for an offense. And the ball got punched out. So, yeah, that one was a little bit odd. But you sit there now, look at what we were going to say. They were going to walk away from that division. Now, New Orleans, you know, loses uh, yesterday. Uh, but Carolina wins. All of a sudden, are we saying, because Christian McCaffrey is back, 
you know, let's see what goes on with the quarterback position. You know, it was Walker who played, obviously, most of the snaps, snaps, but there's Cam Newton with a couple of touchdowns and screaming on back, you know. And But are they? And it would be more about Christian McCaffrey being back, really, than anybody else. And, and the hope that whoever is going to quarterback that team doesn't throw interceptions like Darnold had been doing. So all of a sudden, that division gets a little closer than we thought it was going to be. Yeah, and you know... I'd, I'd been thinking of the Saints as the primary team that could catch the Buccaneers. I hadn't really thought of the Panthers. I'm still digesting what, what we saw yesterday, but they've got the Washington football team this weekend. They've got the Dolphins. They've got the Falcons. They play at the Bills, not the easiest thing in the world. But you know what? They still haven't played right. the Buccaneers this year. They play them twice in the final three weeks. And my favorite Cam Newton stat, Mike, all time in his career, he's 2-0 and against Tom Brady. So uh, the, the, the one team that I did not expect was going to rise up and make this thing interesting could be the Panthers. We're going to talk more about them coming up. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.